three or four weeks to do it, but, you know, <laughs> she was holding out. The book of Psalms, chapter number three. The book of Psalms. Actually, Psalms doesn't have chapters. It's just Psalms. So the third Psalm. You find your place, I ask you to stand with me. Psalm 3. Beginning of verse number 1. The Bible says, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings be on your people, Selah. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. I pray this morning as we look into your word, uh, that you would help us. Lord, I pray that uh, from the top of my head to the sole of my foot, Lord, you'd use me. I pray that preach would come easy. I pray that your people would be encouraged. Uh, but most of all, I pray that your son would be glorified. Lord, I'll say it again. We are a needy bunch of people. And so, God, I pray that you would meet those needs. Help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This morning, if the Lord will help me, I'd like to preach on the subject surrounded by problems, but secure in his promises. Surrounded by problems, but secure in his promises. Psalm 3 introduces to us a series of firsts in the book of Psalms. This is the first psalm that has a title to it. It says it's a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. This is the first psalm that actually calls itself a psalm. It's the first psalm that actually identifies its author who wrote it. It's also the first psalm that states its occasion, what was going on. It's the first psalm that we find the word Selah. Most historical commentators would say that that was some kind of musical annotation. Many argue that the point was to be yelled more emphatically. Some argue that that was a type of rest where you had to stop, think about what was going on. I tend to lean, to, to lean towards the side of it meaning to stop slow down, think about what you just read. This Psalm 3 is also the first psalm in a category of psalms called the Psalms of Lament or the Psalms of Mourning. Basically, David was singing the blues. He was down, he was low, he was at a breaking point, and he was at rock bottom. And so he was singing the blues. Now, I don't know about you, but we may not be exactly in the same spot that David was in, but most of us know what problems are. And if you don't have problems, you come see me after church, I'll give you about five of them. All right? I can, I can share some of mine if we want to lighten the load. We all have problems. We all get sick. We're not immune from it, are we? 
fights with cancers and diseases and viruses all around us. Families, entire families ate up with sicknesses. Sin, problems. We see it around us, don't we? What are we to do? We bury our head in the sand and act like it's not going on? Do we sit down and sing the blues and, and just get so depressed that we ended up asking like Elijah, God, just take my life? What do we do when we're surrounded by problems? Well, I think we kind of look at what David did. First, David took his complaints to God. Don't miss this. You say, preacher, that's simple. Well, if it's so simple, why do you complain to your neighbor and the lady at the church and pick up the cell phone and run your mouth? He took his complaints to God, nobody else. Look at verse number one. He said, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. David told God what his enemies were doing. See, the events that surrounded uh, this psalm are recorded in 2 Samuel 15. Amnon had raped his half-sister Tamar, and Absalom had killed Tamar to, to defend her honor. The family was in an uproar. Absalom was so mad with Daddy David that he ended up causing a rebellion, and he was so young and charismatic and full of life that many of David's friends actually sided with Absalom. And here David is, the king. Here David is, the one that God had anointed to be king, to be on the throne, and his own flesh and blood has turned his own friends against him. David took his complaints to God, telling him uh, what was going on, what his enemies were doing. He also told him what his enemies were saying. In verse 2, he said, Many are saying of me, There is no salvation for him in God. This is a rough statement. This is a tough situation. David, listen to me. I've met people that were bad off. And so have you. Some of y'all are bad off. I've met people that were bad off and I've thought to myself, only God can help them. Man, if, if they get out of that mess, it'll have to be a work of God. Only God. But I ain't never met somebody that was so messed up that I thought to myself, not even God can help them. That's what they were saying of David. That he was in such a spot, in such a situation, under such problems, that God couldn't even help him. See, they looked back at David's past. They looked at David's sins. We know the story. David sinned with Bathsheba. Uh, committed adultery, got her pregnant, brought Uriah home to try to cover up his sin, and when he couldn't, he had Uriah put to death. And the, the whole story, the prophet came and confronted him, and, and David repented, and you know what happened? God forgave him. You know what God does with our sins? He forgives them. Let's just stop long enough to thank God. I know it's Sunday morning. I know you're about half asleep. You probably got bored in Sunday school. It's okay. God forgives sins. He washes us white as snow, removes them from us. But listen to me. Sometimes we have to live with the consequences. I'm reminded of a story of a young boy who was being disorderly. And so every time that he would... He would act up. Every time that he would do wrong, his daddy would go out to the garage door and drive a nail in there. And before long, that little boy went by the garage door and there was hundreds of nails in there. And he realized the, the, the amount of his wrongdoing. And he went to his daddy and said, Daddy, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And so his daddy went out there and pulled all them nails out. 
The little boy came back inside crying. And Daddy said, what's wrong? He said, Daddy, you took the nails out, but the holes are still there. See, God has a way of healing our wounds, but letting us keep the scars to remind us. That's where David was. David couldn't outrun his past. David was living under the condemnation of past sins. God had forgiven him, but he also promised that the sword would never leave his house. Man, they looked at that. Oh, Shimei. Shimei said in uh, 2 Samuel 15, you know, where he says that the hearts of the men have gone after Absalom. And then in chapter number 16, verse 7, Shimei said to him, uh, said as he cursed, Get out! Get out! You man of blood! You worthless man! The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of David. You know what he was doing? You know what Shimei was doing? He was standing in the streets reminding David of what he had done. Say, so, yeah, you may be king, but you're still worthless. God may have forgiven you, but you're still worthless. See, this is weighing in on David. David's family, David's friends had turn their back and now they are, they are rallying support and, and he's, he's now the enemy. And not only is he the enemy, not only has all of this happened, but they're saying, man, God can't even help him. This is weighing heavy on David. The thought was most painful for David that God may have forgot about him. Spurgeon said it's the most bitter of all afflictions, to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. And I'm faced just about anything, knowing that God is my helper. But if God abandons me, if I feel like I can't even lean on Him, what am I to do? I'm like, Peter, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. I don't have nobody else to lean on. I don't have nobody else to depend on. I don't have a plan B or a backup avenue. I am here. Lord, you have to help. This is where David finds himself. He's telling God, God, they're set against me. And now they're saying that, God, you're not even going to help. David took his complaints to God even though people were saying that God would not help David. Who was David talking to? Don't miss that. Don't miss this. They are running their mouths about him. They are turning into enemies. They are running him down. And he, you know what he does? God... They are stacking up against me. They're saying you're not going to help me. Even in the midst of them accusing him of not being able to get God's help, he goes to God for his help. David took his complaints to God. By the way, before I move on, where do you take your complaints? We say that. But where do we really take our complaints. I mean, you won't believe what they're saying about me now. You won't believe what they did. You're calling somebody who can't do nothing about it in the first place. It makes you feel better running your mouth and becoming a gossip, but it doesn't make, it doesn't make the situation any better. Amen. Yeah, that makes us uncomfortable. We're okay. David took his complaint to God. But number two, David put his confidence in God. Look at verse number three. Look at the contrast in between verses one and two and then jumping into three. Verses one and two, they are doing this. They are saying this. And in verse three he says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Though many had said that there was no help for him in God, 
David knew that God was his shield under attack from a cunning and ruthless enemy, under attack from his own flesh and blood and friends who had turned their back on him, David looks to God and says, God, you're my shield. You are the one who's got me covered. You know, I like, I like them, them old medieval movies. You know, I like Braveheart. Y'all pray for me. I like King Arthur. You know, I like them, I like them movies, you know, where they, they, they fight. Maybe something wrong with me. Again, it's okay. But, but something I notice about them things, them shields, some of them's big, some of them's little. I mean, some of them's massive, and some of them's just some small little buckler shields. But, but them shields are pretty good when the enemy's over there, and you can put that thing in between you. But David said, they're all around me. And he said, you're not just my shield in front of me, but you are the shield about me. See, a physical shield may be able to protect me from Slim throwing a songbook at me. But it ain't got my backside. What David is saying is though everybody's running their mouth and though everybody's turned their back and though they're getting ready to kill me, all of this stuff is going on. God, I'm looking to you. I'm depending on you. I'm trusting in you because you are the one who has got my front as well as my back, as well as my rear and my sides. You've got me all about. You know what David was saying? God, you got me covered. You got this. Some of y'all, listen to me. Let me encourage you this morning. Some of you are so fretful. And we have people who listen online that, that are just wringing their hands, worried, walking the floor, wondering what's going to happen. I mean, worried because Fox News has done drove them into a, a panic attack. They're, they're worried what the Democrats are going to do, what the Republicans are going to do, what North Korea is going to do, what the virus is going to do. Listen to me. I don't know, but I do know one thing. No matter what happens, no matter what hell brings our way, no matter what happens in the election, no matter what happens with the economic uh, uh, recovery, no matter what happens all about us, whether it's from the front or the side or the rear, God has got us covered. Amen. Your shield about me. Y'all, this is personal language. David don't say, hey, uh, God, you got me and Slim. Now, God may have Slim. I don't know if God's got Slim. That's between Slim and God. But I do know this. I do know this. David said, you are a shield about me. This is personal language of somebody who had a personal relationship, who had personal experience, who knew God personally. What I'm trying to say is, this wasn't secondhand knowledge. Listen, there comes a time where God has to be more than just your preacher's God. Young folks, there has to come a time when God has to be more than just your parents' God. God has no grandchildren. God's got children. You're not riding somebody else's coattail. Sir, you're not riding your wife's coattail. Ma'am, you're not riding your husband's coattail. This is a personal thing. And in the midst of the fight, you better know him personally. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, think about how miserable lost folks are. If you're here lost, you're miserable. You know you're miserable. You come in here and get all prettied up and put on a front for us, but we know you're miserable because hell's breaking out in this world around us and you ain't got nobody to lean on. 
I can rest assured at night, laying my head on my pillow, knowing that God is still on the throne. Christ died for my sin. The church will prevail. Heaven is my home. The Holy Spirit is my comforter. We have a book. We have a Bible. We have the blood. I have no reason to worry. Y'all popping, popping pills, trying to, trying to keep it all together. God's got me. He's a shield about me. Amen. Then he says, look, my glory and the lifter of my head. Amen. David was in an all-time low. The king was a glorious position. But being moved from his throne by his own son, by his own flesh and blood, was not a very glamorous thing. So David said, look, I have no glory. I have no pride. Lord, this thing has crushed me. But who I am is not anchored in what I do, but rather it's anchored in you. Listen to me. Whenever who you are is so wrapped up in what you do, then what are you going to do when you don't do it no more? I'm more than just the pastor. I'm more than just your preacher. Matter of fact, I'm more than just a husband. I'm more than a father. All of those areas of life, pastoring, family, work, secular, career, all of that stuff could fall to pieces. And it has before, y'all. I've been devastated. And it drove me to a point in the bottom of the deepest depression that I've ever been in, only to find out that I was so wrapped up in what I was doing that I had lost who I was. And so when I wasn't doing it no more, I was no longer nobody. I couldn't pastor. I couldn't be a good husband. I couldn't be a good father. I was destroyed and devastated. God got me to a point where he reminded me that who I am is not in what I do or what I can do, but it's in who he is. This is what he says. You, O oh Lord, are my glory. I have no glory. If there is glory, it's because you are glorious. You are the lifter of my head. Lord, I'm down. I'm low. I've, I've fallen. My enemies are pressing in on against me. But God, you have taken your loving finger and placed it underneath my chin and pulled me up. That's what God does. David put his confidence in God. This is all introduction. Number three. David started contemplating God. David started contemplating God. Look at verse number four. He said, I cried aloud to the Lord. I cried aloud to the Lord. And he answered me from his holy hills. You know what David did? David started thinking about God. Y'all, this is David, right? We're talking about David. This is the same David, the young shepherd boy that was pushed to the backside of the farm when the prophet came to town to look for the next king because his own daddy didn't think that he was worthy to be there. This is the David that God looked past all of the older brothers and said, yeah, I like this one. This is the David that was keeping those sheep on the backside of the pasture when a bear came up. And he killed a bear. And he killed a lion. And he killed a giant. And he had killed the Philistines. And he had war battles. David has a place right now where he can go back to his file cabinet and say, all right, Lord, you've done this. And man, I remember when you've done that. And man, I remember when you was there for me then. Lord, you truly are my shepherd who, who leads me beside still waters. 
Lord, you truly are my rock and my fortress. You surely are my strong tower. David got his mind on who God was and what God had done. He said, he hears my prayers. I cried unto the Lord. He hears me. Others said that God didn't want nothing to do with him. But David said, look, you heard my prayers. You heard me. You answered me. You was paying attention to me. You was there. Nobody else was. But you were there. Not only did you hear me, you sustained me. Look at verse 5. I lay down and slept. I woke again. Why? For the Lord sustained me. Y'all don't miss this. This verse right here is a blessing. Y'all need to go home and write this one on your refrigerator, all right? Above your bed, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Man, when you're asleep, you're dead to the world. Anthony's staying with us, and you know I haven't embarrassed him the whole time that he's been here. <laughs> Listen to me. I believe a tornado could have went through Grace Mont. And I wouldn't have heard it because of somebody else's noise from across the house. I thought a she-bear was in there. Last night, uh, I, was, I was studying and reading and preparing for Sunday school. It was late, and, and Bryce, you know, their small one, had to go to the bathroom. And he was about dead to the world. Anthony was trying to help him through the hallway, and he was walking like a zombie, bouncing off walls and didn't know where he was at. Y'all, when we're asleep, most of us, we're dead to the world. But our hearts still beat. Our lungs still pump. Our blood still circulates. I laid down and slept. And I woke again. Because the Lord sustained me. Don't miss that. Some of y'all are so fretful. Some of you are so worriedful. God sustains us in our sleep. Sleep is a, a blessing. You say, man, I, I just feel so alone. I feel like God doesn't love me anymore. I've been there. Y'all, I've been so, so low, so low. True story. I would cry. Y'all, when I cry, I'm not a pretty crier. I'm an I'm a ugly crier. I don't cry very often, and so it just comes out god-awful. I mean, it was bad. But I remember calling a friend of mine saying, I don't know how I'm going to make this. Don't know. Y'all been there? I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I can't, I can't see the end game in this one. I, don't, I just don't know. Y'all, that was like 15 years ago. I'm still here. You know what happened? I laid down a slip. I woke again. You say, well, God ain't doing nothing for me now. God ain't moving. God ain't, ain't blessing. He ain't answering my prayers. Last night I laid down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Hey, the Democrats can win in November. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to lay down and sleep. God's going to wake me up, and he will sustain me. This world can fall apart, and we can stand in line to get everybody to get food stamps. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to go to sleep. The Lord's going to wake me up. Why? Because he sustains us. Listen to me. God is a God that cares so much that he even sustains you in your sleep. <laughs> oh, David. David said, not only does he let me sleep, he sustains me, but he relieves my fears. Look at verse number six. I ain't going to be afraid. I ain't scared. David started off this psalm in the dumps. We done made it to verse number six. He started contemplating God. You know that's what happens. We sit down in our own little pity party. 
call we call our our, our girlfriends or our our guy from guys don't have we don't do that stuff we we just complain down at the diner all right we sit down in our little pity parties we call our friends we suck our thumbs and pull on our ears and talk about well just nobody loves me God's forgot about me what you ought to do is go to God And you may start in the same place. And you may feel the same way. But man, when you start talking to God, you're like, God, man, I remember remember when you did this for me. And God, I remember when you took care of this. This is what David did. This is where David's at. And by the time that he realized everything that God had brought him from, everything that he had been through, where he was, and what God had promised, David said, you know what? I ain't got nothing to be afraid of. With God sustaining him, David could stand against any foe. Long before Paul ever wrote Romans 8.31, David knew that with God, that with God, if he be for us, No one can be against us. Number four, David gave his conflict to God. Look at this, verse number seven. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. David's mind was both on what he trusted God to do, save me, and on what God had done, he struck his enemies. This is also another first in the book of Psalms. This is what theologians call the first imprecatory psalm. This is the first psalm prayer that is praying that God would strike down something or inflict pain. You know what David's, you know what an imprecatory psalm is? It's, it's, it's when you say, all right, Lord, go get them. This is a go get them psalm. Arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. David looks for protection in this psalm. But but more than protection, he was looking to victory. We've got this idea that just because TBN has abused this word victory, that we as Christians cannot share in victory. Listen, everybody pay attention. All right, we, 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 we on the same level. God didn't save you to be miserable. Somebody strike up a chord. We're ready to go home now. God didn't save you to look like your driver's license picture. Look like you suck lemon before you come inside. Look like your ma-in-law moved in and ain't planning on moving out. God didn't save you to be miserable. And listen to me. God didn't save you to just get by. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. You know Paul wrote that in prison? We got to think, you know, well, I don't have what everybody else has. Well, neither do I. I'm the preacher. All right? I understand not having some things. But you know what? God is faithful to take care of His. And I'm happier with not as much now than I used to be when I had a whole bunch of stuff. That don't make a whole lot of sense to some of y'all because y'all still ain't figured it out. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It is not things, it's not money, it's not 
toys, it's not activities, it's not hobbies, it's not friends, and it's not even your family that is going to bring ultimate joy in your life. When hell breaks out, you need a God who can take care of you. And then David says salvation belongs to the Lord. Look at verse number 8 with me, David. Salvation belongs to the Lord. If I had to summarize the entire Bible, it would be in that statement. You know what David is saying when he's saying this? He's saying, I can't get out of it. God, I can't climb my way, claw my way, scratch my way, pay my way out of this mess. God, if I get saved, you're going to have to do it. That was in the immediate sense and the ultimate sense. Hey, sometimes it does take a mountain. Sometimes it does take a valley. Sometimes God, you say, well, God would never let me go through bad times. He loves me too much. That's why Jesus was crucified, right? God loved him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And God crucified him. But you, I know you, you get to get out of this thing free, right? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Miss, Miss, Miss Beverly, come on, David. I heard a story. I heard a story, and I'm done. I heard a story about a baby that was crying. Come on, Miss, because if you don't come, Miss Beverly, I'm going to preach all day. <laughs> all right? It's Pastor Appreciation Month. I'm trying to make them happy. <laughs> I heard a story about a baby that was crying. And Papa went in there and picked up that baby out of the playpen. Rocked it, held it, soothed it. Mama come in there and said, what are you doing? We don't do that. He's got to learn to self-soothe. So Papa put the baby back down and sure as the world it cried. It whined. And he was mad as fire too. He said, let me pick up that baby. He said, no. She said, no, you can't pick up that baby. He needs to learn how to self-soothe. So Papa sat there, mad as fire. Let that baby cry and whine, and he finally got so aggravated. He went over to the playpen. <laughs> he climbed over in it, and he sat down with him. And he held that baby, rocked that baby, Soothe that baby. And he said, Mama didn't say nothing about me getting in here with him. <laughs> Listen to me. God's not always going to bring you out of your mess. God's not always going to remove the problem from you. God's not always going to answer your prayers exactly the way you think that you need them answered. God's not always going to take the pain or take the sickness or take the trouble. Sometimes God will leave you in there. But man, it's a whole lot better for him to climb over there in there with you. I'd rather have God in the midst of my problems, in the midst. Listen to me. I remember what it's like to be lost. Some of y'all have been saved so long, y'all can't remember this stuff. But I remember what it was like to be lost. I remember what it was like to struggle, to be hopeless, to have problems, and have nobody there to help. I remember that. But now, hell can break out. I have somebody who may not take me out of the problems, but is willing to climb in the trouble with me. He'll step into the muck and the mire. He'll walk through the pain and the affliction. He'll help us. The Bible says he is a ever-present help in the day of trouble. He's a God who cares that much. So, by way of application, why are you moping? God's on the throne, y'all. Y'all know that, right? God's on the throne. The Bible says that He 
raises up kings and leaders. We have a personal responsibility to do what we're supposed to do. But come November, God is still in control. If I could put my hands to people and slap cancer out of them, I promise you I would. I mean, I I would. If I could beat people into doing right, I promise you we would. But I can't. Neither can you. You can't do it. If you could fix your kids, they wouldn't need Jesus. If you could solve your problems, you wouldn't need God. So what God does, sometimes he'll wring us out of self so that we'll lean on him. And if God's doing that to you this morning, you ought to rejoice. Say, God, don't take the thorn. Give me grace in the midst of the thorn. And listen to me. If you're lost here, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Your problems, you're walking alone. Your joy comes in a fifth of something. Your hope comes in the arms of the next person. You're happy, your temporary happy comes in what you can smoke or put in your body. There's no long-lasting hope. But I can introduce you today to one who says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's a God worth leaning on this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much. God, the truth is we are surrounded by problems. But I pray that you would remind us that we're secure in your promises. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Not because of me, but because of you. Lord, my steps are guided by the Lord. Not because of me, but because of you. You have hedged my way. You have made the crooked, crooked way straight. You have broken the bars of iron. You have cleared this thing for me. And so, God, if I walk on the mountain behind you, I pray that I would rejoice. But, God, if you lead me through the roughest valleys, I pray that you would comfort me, help me, and help us. God, we have people here this morning that are struggling. And so, God, I pray that you would comfort them, help them. Lord, let them see your grace and mercy. Let them see your son high and lifted up. And if there's one lost, Lord, I pray that you'd make them miserable. I pray that you'd convict them, draw them, and save them before it's too late. Lord, if you'll do that, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You stand to your